All right. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. And, uh, you know, I have to say, I'm, of course, uh, you know, really impressed by, uh, by the talks that preceded me. I want to give a full disclaimer, namely that I am not smart enough to build such precise uh, instruments. Uh, and so uh, instead, what I will be talking about are the kinds of, uh, are you know, is a topic that I've, uh, enjoyed thinking about quite a bit over the last uh, couple of years, which is really, you know, what can we um, uh, find if we are able to, you know, zero in on the gravity, uh, on the like, you know, precise gravitational field of the outer uh, solar system very well. And so a good place to start um, is really to remind ourselves of the fact that as over the last sort of three decades, as the um, exoplanet revolution unfolded, there's been a parallel revolution in discovery of objects in the outer solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune. So this is it's a top-down view of the solar system. We have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. In uh, blue is the orbit of Pluto, which was in 1930 initially mistaken for a legitimate planet. Turns out it's uh, it's not. It's a particularly big object within the Kuiper belt. And as I've mentioned over the last three uh, three and a half decades, the, um, the census of Kuiper Belt objects, namely things that live beyond the orbit of Neptune, has kind of come into its own and now numbers uh, in the thousands. So the dynamical structure, like right, the orbital uh, kind of construction of the Kuiper Belt tells a really important and interesting story, um, not just about how it is shaped by Neptunian gravity, but also about how the solar system evolved very early in its lifetime. In particular, one of the things that has become very clear by studying the dynamical structure of the Kuiper belt is that the planets did not start out uh, where they are today. Instead, the planets formed in a more compact configuration and instead underwent a uh, transient period of dynamical instability. So what you're seeing now uh, is a, uh, it's a pretty cool movie, but it's also the results of an actual uh, uh, simulation where the planets start out, as I said, in a more compact configuration encircled by a 20 Earth mass disk of uh, kind of icy debris. And then over the subsequent 100 million years, the first 100 million years of the solar system's lifetime, the planets kind of go unstable and then end up roughly where they are today. And this class of models, which are um, kind of instability-driven uh, models, are often referred to as, as the Nice model collectively, and there are many different variants of it, but the basic idea is that uh, at the, as a consequence of this early instability, much of the icy debris that initially encircled the sun gets scattered out, and the remainder the last sort of 0.1% of that stuff is what we now observe as the Kuiper belt. So this tells a pretty cool, pretty interesting story, and you can match all kinds of um, you know, detailed things about Neptune's early uh, evolution by kind of doing these types of simulations. But back a few years ago, we noticed something that uh, was really not part of this picture. And we were inspired by work done by Chan Trujillo and, and Scott Shepard, who discovered actually one of these, um, one of these objects, which they nicknamed Joe Biden. Um, and what we basically noticed is that uh, if you zoom out enough, then um, it looks like all of the really long or uh, really kind of extended members of this trans-Neptunian populations, right, have orbits that have been sculpted somehow. Right, they both all kind of lie somewhat in the same plane. They all kind of uh, face into the same uh, direction. So something interesting is going on. And this was, of course, back in uh, 2016 that this picture was made. And uh, since then, the data set has more than uh, doubled. And it looks like this right now. So I think you don't have to be, you know, an expert, um, you know, an expert 
in transneptunian objects to kind of notice that there's more orbits pointing down and for scale that inner circle is the orbit of neptune and the outer circle is 250 astronomical units um, that sort of characteristic length scale where this clustering pattern begins to appear but one of the um other intriguing things that uh, you can point to now with this kind of expanded data set is that not of all of these um, you know, ob orbits are created equal. Namely, if you ask about their dynamical stability, their present day dynamical stability, uh, then you will find that some of these objects are currently being scattered out. They're on their way out of the solar system effectively. Neptune is uh, clearing them out, while others are perfectly dynamically stable. Their perihelia, right, their closest approach to Neptune is so detached that they don't do anything. They just slowly process and, and are there for the ride. And uh, we've done some work uh, last year together with Rosemary Mardling and David Nisvorny to understand this process better from, um, the, uh, from a celestial mechanics point of view and derived this stability criterion, this uh, critical perihelion uh, distance interior to which you are unstable and exterior to which you are stable. So if you then apply this criterion, um, then a really interesting secondary pattern emerges, nam namely that all the things that cluster together well are the things that are currently not interacting very strongly with Neptune. This uh, kind of right away should tell you that the origin of this um, of this pattern is gravitational in nature because there's no way to kind of bias your observations by dynamical stability, right? In fact, when you observe the night sky, all you see are just point sources. You don't actually know anything about the orbits for the first year. So the fact that this pattern of orbital grouping correlates with uh, perihelion distance is really important and it tells us that something is keeping these orbits gravitationally confined. So you can say, okay, what can that be? Can that be some kind of a, I don't know, a passing star uh, early in the lifetime of the solar system? And the answer is no. Uh, and the reason the answer is no is that if you take the solar system as it is, this pattern as it uh, currently is seen and just leave it alone, then on a time scale of a few hundred million years, which is short compared to the lifetime of the sun, um, this pattern will disperse. So indeed, taken at face value, it looks like something is confining these orbits in real time right now. So that something can really be anything. Uh, you know, it can be a very massive hamburger. It can be a um, a very massive, you know, iPhone. It can be a planet, uh, but the key point is that you can use you know, these types of simulations to calculate the properties, the orbital and the uh, orbital properties and the mass of the type of objects you need uh, to confine the orbits. And the, what you can readily demonstrate is that in order for the outer solar system to look the way that it does, you need a sort of five to maybe 10 Earth mass object which lives on an appreciably eccentric orbit with an orbital period of 10,000 uh, AU, oh, sorry, 10,000 years or so. Um, that translates to a semi-major axis of about 500 AU. And the whole thing has to be slightly inclined, maybe 20 uh, degrees inclined with respect to the ecliptic. And if such an object exists, then what will happen over the solar system's lifetime is that you will originally start out with an axisymmetric uh, disk of material, right? This is stuff that has been scattered out by Neptune during said instability. But then slowly, this object, which we'll call Planet Nine, will carve out uh, the observed pattern. It'll carve out a pattern of stable orbits that are anti-aligned with respect to the orbit of Planet Nine. Why is it anti-aligned? The reason is that during the precession cycle, when orbits align, they actually go through an eccentricity maximum. So during that process, during that eccentricity maximum, the perihelia of these long period orbits get jammed into the orbit of Neptune and then Neptune scatters them out.
So it's this interplay actually between the phase averaged dynamics in, uh, induced by planet nine and the scattering dynamics induced by Neptune that conspire to carve out this pattern of specifically long-term stable orbits that are all pointing into the same direction, which is the opposite direction of planet nine's major axis. Okay, um, so I wanted to actually, again, emphasize here that the removal of perihelion, the fact that these objects again, have their perihelia lifted and their orbital stability and the direction into which their orbits are point uh, into which their orbits point are all correlated within the context of this picture. Um, you can ask and answer the question of how observational bias contributes to um, all of this, and this is um, a plot that my friend Mike uh, made. We published in a paper last year, um, and I like this plot because this tells you. Um, uh, this both tells you where the um, observed objects are in green points on a plot of longitude of perihelion. You can think of as that as the azimuthal kind of direction into which the objects point as a function of the semi-major axes, right? And on the background in red is the of 2D histogram of where these objects should appear if planet nine is there. And each object on top of it has a kind of a band where the blue, light blue color um, signifies where it, it is most likely to be observed. And again, I think you don't have to be a very sophisticated statistician to uh, convince yourself that the objects are kind of appearing in the overlap of where they should be physically and where they are observable just from the overall kind of observational strategy of the cumulative um, you know, footprint of all the um, surveys that have looked for KBOs in the last uh, couple decades. Okay, um, so I want to also draw attention to one intriguing thing, which is that despite the fact that we can do all of these calculations, up until now, uh, we have been kind of largely talking about um, doing these simulations in the context of a universe where the sun is at the center and once stuff goes beyond 10,000 AU, you just deleted from the simulations. But of course, that's not how really how um, the solar system formed. And so during the pandemic, uh, we asked ourselves the following question, like what if we properly, in these calculations, properly account for the fact that the sun was formed in a cluster of about a thousand other stars like the sun, would that change the answer somehow? And of course, we know the sun was formed in the cluster because we see, um, you know, magnesium 26, which is a daughter product of aluminum 26 all over the place in meteorites. And aluminum 26 was, uh, you know, the short-lived um, you know, radiogenic isotope, which polluted the solar system uh, early in its lifetime. And that can only come from being born in a cluster of stars. So here's the basic story. And I'll go through this uh, pretty briefly, um, but it's, it's we just have to be use a little bit of logic. So if the solar system starts out in a cluster of stars, right? and you believe that Jupiter and Saturn are there, I think every, all of us believe that Jupiter and Saturn really are there, then you cannot escape the construction of something called the inner Oort cloud. And here's why. As Jupiter and Saturn are forming, their gravity is becoming stronger and they will scatter away a bunch of icy debris. If the solar system is alone in the universe, this debris just scatters out and leaves forever. But if the solar system is embedded in a cluster, then passing stars can perturb these ejecting debris and actually fossilize them on uh, length scales of order 10,000 astronomical units. If planet nine is not there, then this fossilized torus of icy debris just sits there and nothing happens to it, right? And just slowly orbits the sun and is very boring and it's not observable. But if planet nine is there, um, what we found is that actually much of this material can get re-injected back into the, um, into the solar system. And in fact, it 
follows the same pattern of clustering that um, that we observe in the simulations of just working with the Kuiper belt. Of course, the same pattern of clustering that we um, also see in the in the data itself. So um, this part slide's a little boring because you know in order to do this calculation, you actually have to do the process of simulating the sun uh, in the cluster and simulating the formation of Jupiter and Saturn, how they um, eject all this material and how it gets trapped in the outer solar system. So it's a, uh, it's a bunch of effort, but at the end of the day, what you find out is that if the outer solar system, right, if the most distant regions of the Kuiper belt, right, Com are composed largely of material that has been re-injected back in from this fossilized inner Oort cloud population, you would see the same thing as if uh, the distant scattered disk was populated just by the conventional uh, Kuiper belt. However, the parameters of the planet that you need um, to explain the data are different uh, on a, in a quantitative sense. In particular, if all this stuff is injected from the inner Oort cloud, you kind of a more eccentric, longer period planet. Unfortunately, we have no way to resolve this, right? So as a result, um, you know, all bets, I would argue, are on gravity. And a group led by Agnes Feyenga uh, has been doing uh, this rather interesting and remarkable work of taking all you know, conventional spacecraft data, so Cassini, Juno, um, the Mars orbiters, and putting them together and trying to use that collective um, data set, the collective ephemerides of the spacecraft to ask, is there a region in the night sky where the existence of Planet Nine is ruled out and where it is favored? And they have made uh, considerable progress Actually, so they demonstrated that uh, you know Planet Nine at 300 AU, for example, is completely ruled out. I think that's maybe not a huge uh, surprise, but there are regions of the night sky where the ephemerides get better with Planet Nine by like one percent or something. So it doesn't, in all, at all, uh, warrant any kind of talk of a detection. But I think that this is really promising, and I think that if we had uh, some way to better sample the cumulative kind of outer solar system gravitational field, that might be perhaps the best way, the best uh, pathway towards uh, detection of, of the object itself. Because I got to tell you guys, uh, I started observing with, in, you know, with respect to this project and observing is really hard. You have to stay up all night at the telescope and and that's just not for me. Uh, so um, I think at this point I'm at T minus uh, two minutes. So I will I will stop here, and uh, we'll be back uh, to take any questions. I think. Thank you.